Hello, we'll be starting in a minute. Thank you for joining us. And I'm promoting Julie Curtis to panelist. Hello, John. Sorry, I was having trouble with getting into the webinar this morning. So I'm here now. So super. It's uh, it is the appointed hour. So shall we begin? Yes, let's go ahead. Okay, super. Uh, thank you and uh, for uh, coming to CETE Faculty, Pedagogy, and the Power of Evidence-Based Teaching. My name is John Bridge, and I'm a marketing Luminati here at Lumen Learning. Joining me is Julie Curtis, uh, the Vice President, who is the leader of the Lumen Circles program at Lumen Learning, and also joining us is helping us out is our sign language interpreter, Jody Prysock. Uh, so if you need, we have the captions going, uh, but if you, if you need her services, please pin her video now. Uh, we will be using the chat function throughout the session. If you have any questions or comments, uh, please use chat. And we are very fortunate to be joined today by a dream team of panelists. And so we're going to let them introduce themselves. Mandy, you wanna kick it off? Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mandy Newcomb and I am an instructor in Prince George, British Columbia, Canada. I teach the professional cooking course here at the College of New Caledonia. I am uh, the department coordinator and I have a couple of staff that um, we collaborate and work together, um, colleagues, I should say. And um, I've been doing this role for two years now. I've been full-time instructing for three years and I have been teaching on and off for 15 years formally. Prior to that, obviously, um, always teaching people and training in different kitchens that I've worked in. Super, thank you, Mandy. Tom? Hi everyone, my name is Tom Pearl and I am an adjunct professor at Hartford Community College. I started teaching uh, about three years ago in the uh, computer, computer information technology field. Uh, mostly I am teaching the office programs to the students and um, I teach uh, the classes are one day long classes. So there's a lot we get through in one day. Um, and I've been in IT for almost 30 years and teaching people as I go. Uh, so it's, it's been more of a, not in a classroom until about three years ago. Super, thank you. Tracy? Hello everyone, good afternoon. I'm Tracy Clifford and I'm an instructor at Chattanooga State Community College in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I've been an instructor for about seven years after about 30 years of experience out in industry as a quality engineer. So I really enjoy teaching students from all different areas, from all different ages and introducing them into my programs. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, so I'm going to turn the floor, give the floor to Julie to talk about what's unique about career CTE faculty. Thank you so much, John. Um, I will also note that we had planned to have, uh, before uh, we get started, we had also uh, had a SUNY uh, nursing professor who had planned to join us and she unfortunately had a conflict surface. So for any of you who might be here uh, to hear from her, we will try and get her on another panel on another time. But I wanna add my thanks to all of our panelists and to also our attendees for joining us today. 
So we're going to be talking about uh, professional development for career and technical education uh, uh, faculty specifically. Um, these are unique faculty members in that they come in as educators with a strong technical expertise. Um, that's why they get hired to train uh, members of our, our workforce and, and people that are that are heading in those career directions. But they also come in not always trained in, in the art and the, the science of teaching. Um, very often the type of education that they're doing is very hands-on and practical um, as, any, uh, as any faculty member, especially the career and technical education faculty can appreciate over the past year, it doesn't easily translate into every modality. And so figuring out how do you do, uh, how do you educate students well when there's a lot of hands-on, um, you know, actual practical training can be a challenge. Um, also, the courses and the curriculum um, in many of these fields are constantly changing in response to needs of employers, in response to how the technology or the practices are changing in the field. Um, and so that makes uh, being able to stay on top of what you're, what you're teaching and how you're teaching um, students a, a moving target. The course and the, the programs can often uh, be, they, they can vary in length as Tom alluded to. Uh, he has uh, courses that he teaches that may just be one day with a student. And, and so how, you know, how to kind of flex the training and the approach um, to meet those demands is also challenging. Um, and, um, and, and then a final point um, is that uh, these are faculty members who recognize that the quality of the training they're doing really is a matter of lives and livelihood for the students that they're training. And so um, wanting to give them the best and equip them to go out and be successful in their jobs and in the career paths that they're, they're defining is really important. So all of this comes together to reinforce how critical quality education is, especially for these students and these faculty members to be able to deliver it. John, would you go to the next slide? Thank you. So what we're going to be talking about today is professional development that brings the, uh, the practices of evidence-based teaching into the career and technical education disciplines. When we talk about evidence-based teaching, what do we mean? So um, first off, there is a growing body of learning science that is helping us understand what are the kinds of things that if you do in the classroom, your students will be more successful. Um, there are practices that apply across disciplines. So if you can incorporate more of these kinds of things, regardless of what you're teaching, it will be more effective to your students. And so that's part of what we're talking about. The other piece of what we talk about with evidence-based teaching is what are you doing in the classroom to create a body of evidence for yourself about what's working for your students? And so in the professional development that we provide and that these career and technical education faculty members have participated in, we're bringing both of these pieces together to give them opportunities to become more aware and more familiar and more intentional about the choices they're making in the classroom, uh, looking at this kind of this collective body of what, what's the evidence saying? What are the things that I can be doing to be more successful with my students? So let's keep going. Uh, uh, so here we have a poll. So this is something we would love to uh, have our, our attendees participate in. Um, we'll talk a little bit, we'll, we'll talk a lot more about evidence-based practices, but first we'd like to give you the opportunity to uh, take a quick poll, it's anonymous. Um, this is just a, a quick poll around familiarity to give you a sense of when we say evidence-based teaching practices, what are the kinds of things that we're talking about? Um, so if you don't mind, just take a moment and respond to the poll. First, we'd, are, we, we'd love to know who's here. So let us know your role. And then the other questions are, are simply taking, I think four of the different evidence-based practices that are part of the, the framework of things that faculty members can explore. And um, just tell us what your familiarity is with those to get a little flavor of, of the kinds of teaching strategies we're talking about. So John, let us know as, as those votes are coming in. Yeah, votes are votes are coming in, but we have a little ways to go. All right, thanks. We're not quite to half of the attendees just yet. So let's give it a little more time. All right, it is very quick, so, and uh, no judgment either, so. <laughs> just we're curious to see your uh your familiarity with these things oh we're two-thirds in 
as far as votes. Uh, we're getting close to the group, the entire group. We're almost there. And I, I think we have a valid sample here, at least. We have a majority of, of attendees uh, to the poll. So we're going to end polling and share the results. Thanks. All right, so it looks like we've got a lot of faculty members, um, a fair amount of administrators, and it looks like that's adding up to more than 100%. So we've got a few people, more than a few maybe, who are wearing multiple hats. So that is great to see. Um, and uh, so uh, looking at these different practices, so community building. So this is one we, we've actually seen a lot of engagement with over the past year with Lumen Circles, with all of the, the online teaching. So we've got um, a lot of people who find this helpful frequ frequently, nearly half, and then others have, uh, have tried it sometimes and others are, are less familiar with it. Um, moving on to formative feedback. So we've got more than half who use this, uh, use this approach frequently. That's awesome. Um, we've got about a third who use it sometimes and fairly, you know, not too many people for whom that's a newer, a newer strategy. Um, around adaptability. So uh, seeing, kind of gauging what students are doing and adjusting what you're doing in response to the progress that you're seeing and the needs that you're seeing. Um, so a majority of faculty members are, are or a majority of people are incorporating this regularly and then, and then smaller uh, percentages for whom it's uh, doing it sometimes or, or not so much. And then finally, time on task. So using your, your, your classroom time to help give students time uh, to practice and focus on the skills that you're trying to help them learn. So this is another one that we're seeing uh, with a lot of about half people are doing that regularly, about a quarter use that sometimes, and then fewer percentages uh, have not done that quite as much. So thank you, I appreciate that. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's go on to the next slide. Okay, so this slide um, illustrates the framework that our faculty fellows in Lumen Circles programs are engaging with. Um, the, uh, these categories are adapted from work from Gail Mello. A few years ago, she published, she and, and uh, co-authors published a book called Taking College Teaching Seriously, Pedagogy Matters. And so the first four categories, supportive, challenging, varied, and organized, are actually um, adapted from a lot of her work and the work published in that book. Um, what they were trying to do is look at what is the learning science saying around the types of teaching strategies that if faculty members do them, uh, it supports their student success. And so these are different dimensions of the learning environment that you can, um, that you can shape and it's important to think about each of these dimensions as you're, um, as you're working with students. Um, so the supportive learning environment is around building connections and trust so students feel you know, well connected and, and it's, a, it's a safe place for them to learn. Um, challenging is around creating uh, both a sense of challenge but um, motivations and high expectations so that the students find uh, it stimulating to learn. Um, a varied environment provides a variety of different ways for students to, to access learning and to engage with the learning materials. An organized learning environment provides great structure and guidance to help uh, students know what are the kinds of things I, sh I, I should be doing or connecting and syn syn uh, synthesizing the things that they're learning. Um, to help them progress better. Um, the, the fifth category, belonging, is the product of a grant project that Lumen uh, has uh, been working on over the course of this past year, funded by the Gates Foundation. Um, when Lumen introduced Lumen Circles uh, a year ago, almost exactly, um, we had the opportunity to look at what was here and also look at other areas to um, expand the kind of the relevance or the capabilities in this framework and noted that there is there was areas for us to grow and improve in the dimension of diversity, equity, and inclusion. 
And so the Gates Foundation uh, stepped up and offered funding. Um, we, we proposed a, a project that would allow us to incorporate more of these uh, diversity, or, uh, diversity or DEI oriented practices into the framework. And so the result of that is the belonging category. And so you can see uh, practices that, that are called out there. The fellows that we have here today actually were completing this project uh, or completing their fellowships before the belonging category was added. Um, but we're excited with all the circles going forward that we will be able to bring that dimension and offer that as an area that our fellows will be able to explore going forward. The other thing that I'll note in that Gail Mello work that we build on is um, that 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 uh, project was also looking at what type of an experience could you bring faculty members through that would give them more exposure to evidence-based practices and opportunities to become more thoughtful and intentional about how are they incorporating those into their teaching. So we'll talk more about that today, but that that faculty uh, engagement methodology to explore this framework is, a, is another important piece of this experience. So let's keep going. So uh, just summarizing about evidence-based practices, we know many faculty members are using these already. They may not, um, often we, we see faculty members come in and say, well, I do a lot of these things already. I just didn't necessarily know they had a name or a body of evidence behind them and a pedagogical purpose behind them. And so it's exciting to see that discovery process and help faculty members recognize their strengths and then build on those strengths as they're looking to expand their teaching repertory. Um, we know that when faculty members use these practices, and we see this in, uh, in current research, it increases their preparedness, their confidence teaching, and as they use these uh, as they use these practices more and more, we know from the evidence again that student success will increase. So let's hear from our panel. Um, so uh, John, do you want to tee up this question? I think you're muted. Right, it's on mute. So, okay. So uh, now we're going to go round robin to answer the question, why should CTE faculty explore evidence-based teaching practices? Once again, Mandy, you are first. Okay. <clears throat> Pardon me. So uh, my thoughts behind it was that I really enjoyed the AI um, learning and sort of collaborating with my fellows and um, building you up giving you the momentum to keep striving for new ideas. Um, like I said earlier, I've been doing teaching sort of for 15 years on and off. And I had learned um, strategies, I suppose, from more aged uh, colleagues who sort of did things one way. And I thought that was a good way. And I continued doing that. And you sort of get stuck in a, what I would call a robot mode. If, if it isn't broke, don't fix it. And we just kept doing it that way. However, um, as it became to be more of a, a scholarly uh, instructor, I suppose, and learning more and just older as a, a person, that there were a lot more strategies out there and I wanted to explore these. And so I really, really enjoyed that we could bounce these ideas off of each other. And like uh, Julie mentioned, realized that I was using some of these already and um, was glad to explore them even more so. Super, uh, thank you. Tom, same question. Um, I think evidence-based teaching is something we all need to, to look at. Um, a lot of the uh, uh, businesses and uh, hospitals and, and things of that nature are going on evidence-based practices for how they function and how they uh, do things. So as teachers, we need to also um, make sure we're getting our students to understand that they need you know, how evidence-based things work. Um, and in, in doing the, uh, the Bloom and Circles Fellowship, I learned that I was already doing some of these things, just as uh, Mandy said and as Julie commented about. And um, I think that, you know, I, I've learned a lot of other ways that I could make my classes better so that my students get a better experience and retain more information. Super, thank you, Tom. Tracy? Well, you know, being in engineering and working as an engineer, I think pretty structured and design my classes structured to begin with. 
but there was so much that I was missing as far as um, the whole caring aspect, the whole community building aspect. I kind of thought I was doing that, but I real that was the part of the design I was missing. And so going through this, it, it kind of, I don't want to say force, but it opened up those areas to me so that I could engage with my students in a way that I hadn't done before. And the feedback that I was giving them, I learned how to improve the feedback, not to write a missive back to them, but just short things that really help keep the engagement going. And I'm working really hard to try to continue to um, implement these into my class this summer and my class is going into the fall. And I, I know it has made me a better instructor, just like I think uh, was said before, we're not, or I'm not from a uh, teaching background. I don't have a degree in education. And it has really, I think, assisted with me elevating my teaching style and design. Awesome, thank you, Tracy. All right, I can jump in here again. Thanks, John. Um, as we, uh, we we thought it would be helpful to paint a little bit more uh, of a picture of what this experience is, and then we will spend the bulk of the time hearing from the panel and having them share more about their uh, experiences and the kinds of teaching uh, uh, enrichment that this was for them. Um, so when we think about Lumen Circles, it really is designed around communities of practice. And these are virtual communities of practice. And so it's, it's convenient going through a pandemic to have a, a great professional development experience that can be delivered online. But a community of practice is a group of people who share a common interest or a common passion, a common goal, and they are working towards that goal individually, but they also come together to practice it regularly. And because they come together to share feedback, to give each other tips, to share ideas, and they are able to get better at it more quickly and, and refine the, the collective expertise of the group because they're doing it together and interacting regularly. And so that's what Lumen Circles is about. Could you go to the next slide, John? Certainly. So there are really these four different aspects of a Lumen Circle experience. So um, it extends typically over nine weeks and um, in the beginning, you're joining a virtual community. So you're, you're connecting with peers. Uh, typically, this is 10 to 12 faculty members along with an expert facilitator. Um, together, there is a weekly set of activities, a curriculum that guide you through exploring um, evidence-based teaching practices. And um, in addition, the communities have a focus on, on a particular lens or a particular area of emphasis. It might be active learning. It might be teaching online. Um, it might be just going deeper into evidence-based teaching and, and the different um, kind of course design elements around that. So faculty members um, ahead of time are choosing the emphasis of their circle theme, and they go through this weekly curriculum a weekly set of activities that give them opportunities to explore that topic and the, the full evidence-based teaching framework in the context of that topic. At the heart of this experience are reflections and we'll, we'll hear, you'll be able to see and hear about what the reflection activities really are. Um, but that's an opportunity to step back and think deeply about the ideas, the teaching strategies that you're learning about and look for ways to either plan or go out and implement, go out and try incorporating these strategies into your teaching. Then you come back and you share with a group, here's how it went, here's how it worked, here's what I learned, here's what I might do differently. It's also an opportunity for members of the community to say, hey, I hit this, I hit this challenge or I would love feedback in this area. Um, the feedback model is also um, kind of a positive oriented uh, strengths based approach called appreciative inquiry. I suspect one of our panelists will talk a little bit more about that in their comments, but creating that positive receptive um, tone in the circle is important so that it helps to coach and encourage faculty members as they explore and expand their capabilities. And then periodically they step back and uh, just look at what is this doing for my teaching overall? What's the impact that we're seeing on students. Could you go to the next slide? 
Um, so here, uh, this slide highlights the different um, areas of emphasis. And as a reminder, each of these areas are, are topics of a circle so that you're exploring the full breadth of evidence-based teaching practices, but through the lens of that particular circle theme. Um, and so we, we're, we're excited to offer a variety of these and, and we have, I think, multiple themes are represented here by our panel today. Um, let's keep going. Um, so here, uh, John, I'm going to share my screen. If you could unshare for just a minute, mm -hmm. I wanted to take uh, just a moment and show uh, show attendees what this looks like. And so, let's see, sharing my screen. So the limit. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. So, uh, so Lumen Circles happen in a website, and this is what that website looks like. So over here on the right-hand side, or sorry, the left-hand side, when you log in, um, you see the members of your circle. So there's a purple marker uh, that indicates who your, your facilitator is. Our facilitators are educators, in some cases, former educators, but they have gone through a lot of training around facilitating virtual communities and uh, cultivating the expertise and the growth of the community. And then as you see here, a variety of different circle members, if you click on any of them, you can see uh, information that they may, may have shared about their profile, who they are, what they teach. Um, and so there's a lot of dialogue and interaction that happens um, over the course of, of, the of the term to engage with your circle members. When you come into the platform, it takes you to whatever the week of activities are that you're doing in that circle. This happens to be a circle focused on online teaching. And so in, uh, in this is a, the second week of, of the, the nine week uh, cycle. And each week there's, there, so there's strong learning design that we're trying to build and model into this experience. So there's a set of learning outcomes, a set of learning activities that are aligned with those outcomes. And then the assessment is where the reflection happens. And so if I click on the reflect button, um, the reflection is, is gives you a prompt or some things to think about after you've gone through you know, readings or, or viewed a video or done other kinds of interactive activities um, for that week. Um, this particular reflection is asking a fellow to plan some kind of tweak or adjustment they wanna make to a learning activity in the coming week to apply evidence-based practices. So they describe what their plan is going to be. They might ask for feedback or ask for ideas. They indicate which of the uh, evidence-based teaching practices they're gonna be incorporating that week. And then when they save it, it puts that reflection out there for the community. And then members of the community can jump in and respond. And so here you see the kind of dialogue that can take place. You'll also notice the evidence-based practices are showing up here kind of like hashtags. And, and so um, early in the circle, uh, fellows are just you know kind of getting their heads around what that is. But over time, that becomes a common language that they can use to be able to talk about and articulate the kinds of things they're aiming for, the kinds of things they're trying to do with their teaching. So I'm gonna stop sharing now. We're gonna go back to the panel. Um, we had asked each of the panelists to select one of the reflections, uh, one or a couple, I think in Tom's case, um, to tell us about that reflection experience and share how, uh, share how that uh, reflection has been helpful for them in their development of their teaching capability. So Mandy, do you wanna start us out? Sure. So uh, obviously with COVID this year, up in, uh, my school, we were very limited to what kind of practical applications we could uh, use. The cafeteria was closed um, or very limited customers. We had very limited people on campus and then we weren't permitted to open our restaurant on campus either. And so this was a huge setback uh, for the practical learning and application of the curriculum for the students. So of course I had to get a bit uh, creative as we all did and um, buffets and banquet type services um, are very important part of the learning. So basically what we had the students do was create a mock buffet. We uh, divided them into two teams that uh, they got to pick basically and um, had to do everything you would normally do for a buffet, but not make all that food. So there's many other components. So we had to get creative with um, how they were going to set it up, how they were going to plan simple things like cutlery and what plateware and where to put things. 
uh, how to decorate. And so there was a lot of teamwork that had to go into it, a lot of um, critical thinking and practical learning <clears throat> still was able to take place. Uh, we were able to invite a few select guests to come in and the students made um, kind of like a dialed back plated version for a couple of special guests. And um, they actually really enjoyed the opportunity and therefore didn't really miss out uh, quite as much as they might have otherwise. Um, some things that were important to me is buffets is a very fun part of the learning in my opinion. So uh, focusing on the enjoyment, I'm just looking at my little cheat sheet here because I can't quite read all that. Um, enjoyment, multimedia learning. So we did do some teaching via videos and photographs on how to set up the buffet, uh, made a bit of a collage with past events photos. Um, contextualization, and uh, students will have access to actual themed buffet packages from the past. Uh, basically, they have keys, menus, grocery lists, etc. So we were able to use um, a lot of different resources to help them out. Also, they collaborated with uh, small teams and they made a lot of connections. So I still felt that it was um, very valuable style of learning and um, my peers, my fellows really helped me out, um, as I mentioned earlier, with the appreciative inquiry, the AI, uh, giving positive feedback and um, some other things that I didn't mention earlier is I really enjoyed the camaraderie and the sounding board. And I found this really helped me develop my own creativity, let alone with the students. Thank you. Uh Tom, would you like to tell us about your reflection? Sure. So um, this was for my advanced Excel class. And so uh, the way the classes work is they, they build on each other. And, you know, so they have to you know, take beginning and then intermediate and then take it advanced. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it was a one day class. So it's a little challenging to compress all the information into one, class, one day. Um, but what we did is um, since we're in COVID, it was, it was online where it was just video like we're doing now. And I could have them share their screens and they could, um, they could see my screen obviously. And so I had them uh, before the before the class started. We sent out a, a message to them to bring a, a challenge to the class, something that they were are working on in their uh, employment that they need to, to solve, but they're having trouble with. And so that allowed us to um, contextualize the information better for the students, so that they could see how the different functions and formulas fit in and work together to help them solve a problem. And it allowed them to collaborate where, you know, they could talk about different ideas about how they would go about solving this problem. You know, one person may solve it one way, another person may solve it another way. And that helps build community when, you know, they're, they're able to, just, to discuss this with each other. Um, so, I have had brought up two of the uh, weeks because the way this particular fellowship worked, and I, I may, it may be how they're moving forward, I'm not sure. The one week we would come up with what we wanted to do. And then the following week, we would actually talk about how we executed it and whether it was successful or not. And so that was the challenge accepted week. It was like, okay, I, I've asked you to bring your challenge to class and now we're accepting the challenge and we're gonna make it work. And in this process, you know, the, the fellows that we work with uh, in, in the circle as, as we're doing this, um, were able to give me ideas on how I could help contextualize, how I could show caring, and uh, build collaboration and, and help the students to uh, go beyond their means and uh, have some higher order thinking about. Um, and you know, the feedback from the fellows is, is 
awesome in helping me to learn how to better help my students. Um, I, I was a little bit of a overachiever. I went and looked at everyone's um, reflections every week because I just felt like there was so much to learn from everyone that I, I needed to do that. Uh, and uh, the, the collaboration within the circle helped me uh, work on how to have the students collaborate. So, uh, I mean, I, we also learned about some different methods or modalities. So, um, you know, including videos so that, you know, it's not just me talking the whole time or, um, you know, just different ways of teaching, you know, maybe doing some whiteboard work since it's online, uh, splitting into groups, uh, those types of things. Awesome. Thank you, Tom. Tracy, tell us about your reflection. Well, this is a reflection on a project that takes the full semester. Um, this is a class called Code Standards and Regulations, a recipe to put people to sleep normally. <laughs> and it's really important to me to be in a face-to-face -face classroom with that particular course because I have them work and do things and it's just not me lecturing. So with this project, it has different deliverables at different times of the semester so that they can do the work and I can make sure they spend time on task and they can get all the activities completed. The change, usually it ends with a presentation and instead in years past, instead of the students doing the presentation in front of class, I ask them to the best of their abilities to videotape themselves or actually let's say the real world, they record themselves usually on a phone or on an iPad or some sort of tablet. So this year, since we were all using these platforms, I asked them, I want you to go on to Teams or Zoom or WebEx and I want your team to record your presentation. I wanna see you sharing back and forth and I wanna see you possibly using the chat as if somebody was um, an actual participant. And that did not go over well. So I kind of left it for a couple of weeks. They had done their background and their history on a regulation. They were setting up, you know, the beginning of the outline of their presentation. And I had several students talk to me outside of class or at the end of class, just with a lot of anxiety about doing this platform presentation. So that's where I adapted. And I decided I was only going to use the Teams platform because they're all students. They all have Microsoft 365. And I spent one class, I said, you know what, guys, we're just going to practice using this. So I set it up where they could watch me go in and create a brand new team. I took my time. I went ahead and added team members to it, opened up the team, and then showed them how it was so easy to click record and how it would actually, when you were done recording, that would go up to the cloud and you could retrieve it. And I said, if they wanted to, with this practice, go ahead and put that recording in the Dropbox, just to show me, I don't care how bad it is. This is, this is just practice. You're not getting a grade. You can't, you can't do poorly on this. And so after about, and I put them in the breakout rooms, and let them do this. And I was in all their teams, so I kept getting all these invitations to join their team but I just sat and waited. And about after 15 minutes, the first team came back and they went, well, that wasn't hard at all. And they, you know, I asked them about what they had done. They said they had already put the recording in the Dropbox. I was very, uh, very thrilled with what they had done. I gave them a lot of positive feedback. And I said, you know what, you're done for the day. Go ahead and go. So that happened a couple of more times. Then I had one team that was only one person by themselves because their two team members were missing. But he actually asked me to come into his team. I went to his team. He showed me what he had done all by himself, the recording he had made all by himself, and that he had actually taken some of the group history material and had put it into the recording and put it into the Dropbox. And again, I just could not express how much that I thought the student had done so well 
that they were considerate of their time and that they had kind of pushed themselves. So finally, at the end of the class, I had one team left and that was the team that really was not happy about this project. And so I uh, emailed into them, I said, are you okay? And they said, you know, come into our team and they did. And they had already started working on putting their presentation into the recording. They were showing me how they could swap back and forth. And again, they were just saying, we would not have known how to do this. We would have not known how to use this without being forced to practice. So what this comes back to for me is, I don't think I'm a poor listener, but sometimes I think students, it's like, oh, well, they're just, you know, they're just not sure and they're not putting themselves forward. They're not trying. I know that's a terrible thing to say as an instructor. But going through the Lumen Circle and really practicing all these other strategies, you know, really looking at all the different, um, looking at all the different ways that to use caring or supportive or multimodal and recognizing using those allowed me to put myself maybe more in the student's shoes and think about what their needs were and so this is my big adaptability reflection. And the main thing I got out of this when I was writing this reflection up was the students all talked to me. It wasn't them in chat. It wasn't blank screens. They were all inviting me to enter their teams or they came back to the room after that 15 minutes and they were all showing their faces. And that to me was one of the, the what elevated this assignment that it kind of broke through some of those barriers that we had with the pandemic and that this small assignment and practicing in the breakout room changed the whole dynamic for the rest of the semester and probably improve uh, the final product that they submitted. Wonderful story. Thank you, Tracy. Um, we only have a few minutes left, Julie. Should we go to uh, attendee questions? Um, sure, we can actually, why don't we tee up the first panel question? We can also stop sharing the, uh, the slides um, so that we can, uh, so that we can see, I think more faces and less slides. I am always a, a fan of that. Sure. And um, in the meantime, if you have questions, please send them in via the chat. Absolutely. Uh, so the question is what, what kind of difference has this, has this made on your students? You can speak in any order you want. I'll go first. Um, my students were, were uh, impacted greatly, I believe, because it allowed them to, me having been through Lumens, helped me help them, and they could see how to do things and improve themselves uh, with how they use the software that we were using Excel to solve problems that they, they didn't know how to solve otherwise. So um, I saw a great improvement just in watching the students and how they learn from, from other classes I had taught to this class, and I could see a big difference. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Tracy, Manny, who, who wants to go next? Oh, I have something, <clears throat> pardon me. I found um, with my applications of what I was learning, from my fellows and from the program, my students got a lot more opportunity to be um, creative and have more input in their learning. So uh, typically I would just do it one way and sort of colonial style where this is the lesson, this is what you have to do. And obviously not only just with COVID switching things up and um, sort of changing how we did our, our teamwork in our class because my students literally would have to work side by each on some uh, assignments. We weren't allowed to do that. So we had to be creative. They got to have a lot more input. Um, and I think it was wonderful. They seemed to be really enjoying it and you know, not doing the same thing. Routine is sometimes good. And like Tracy mentioned, structure is good. But in my um, trade, it is very much art um, focused because of all the cooking and um, creativity is very important. So I think that was the big takeaway for my students. Super. Tracy, something to add? Sure. I think, you know, listening to my students was a great thing, but 
also part of learning to listen to my students was doing the appreciative inquiry every week and reading everyone else's reflections and and not just you know thinking about it a little bit about how can i help them by giving them almost feedback in my appreciative inquiry and then that makes me think of my own project or my own reflection i had done and then that transferred itself to me listening more and to the feedback from my students so uh, there's so many different uh, areas of this going through a lumen circle. I absolutely love this lumen circle. It, it allowed me to be creative and it allowed me to reconnect with my students. We have two excellent questions coming in through the chat. Uh, Renee asks, is it best to take the lumen training during the semester while teaching a course? I'm thinking of taking it the training over the summer, but that may not be a good idea. I don't teach during the summer. This is based on the activities that may be required by the training. So the question is, is it best to take the Lumen training while teaching the course? Um, I would say it's not a requirement, but it does help. Um, since my classes are typically one day long, a lot of the Lumen circle time for me was without a class, but I could look at other classes I had taught and use examples from those to present an idea of how to, how I could learn better to teach my students. And then I did have a class during the, the Lumen session and I was able to actually apply it and see results right away. So there, there's advantages to having a class at the same time, but I don't think it's required. From my perspective, um, I kind of agree with Tom in that um, when I first started, the program I was on my professional development time and then when I wrapped it up I had of uh, my class in session and um, while the time commitment was a little bit more challenging when you actually had a class because of other commitments. Um, I found it more beneficial personally to actually develop these lesson plans and do them the very next week and get real results um, as we're at the beginning the first week. I believe one and two, I sort of queued up a, a lesson and changed it up and had my partner, my colleague uh, moderate it. And then I had to go and get feedback from them. And, and you certainly could apply it to other, you know, things you've done in the past, but I, I found it more beneficial when I actually had students. So I'd like to build on what bo both Tom and Mandy said. There really is a benefit of having a class at the time because it kind of forces you to practice and I'm big on having students practice and it was sometimes a little uh, time consuming because I kind of go overboard but at the same time it by the time I implemented in class I almost learned how to simplify and I got immediate feedback I got a feedback from my lumen circle partners I got feedback from the students what things didn't work, I knew immediately, but I could change it up. And I really enjoyed getting that immediate feedback. Awesome. I, I will also note that the the Lumen, that the, the community of practice methodology and the curriculum does kind of assume that you're actively teaching. And so um, if you're not actively teaching or there's not a complete overlap, you can definitely draw from past experiences or work on uh, you know course design improvements that you're trying to make. Um, but by and large, you'll get the most out of it if you're doing it where you're teaching for at least a portion of, of the experience. Um, there is one more question I think that's related to this. So what's the weekly time commitment? I'll start with what we design and then uh, Tracy, Tom and Mandy could jump in and say what the reality is. Um, we, we do, at least for them, um, we do design the activities so that they could be done in around two hours per week. Um, and in our feedback surveys, we actually ask how, what, how much time did it, did it actually take? And we have about two thirds of the, of the fellows that say, yeah, it was right around two hours on average um, with you know, some saying it was a little bit more and some saying that it was, it was a little bit less. But Tracy, Tom, or Mandy, what would you say? I would say the two hours is, is a pretty good representation. There's some weeks though that I probably went closer to three there's some weeks it was a little bit easier for me. Maybe I had content that I just kind of redesigned and put it in and maybe that only took a, you know, an hour, 10 minutes. So you make it what you also want out of it. I, I would agree with that. Um, 
I had said I was an overachiever, and, and so I probably spent closer to four hours a week, but that was only because I was reading every reflection every week and trying to comment on every reflection every week so that I could hopefully help the other fellows and also learn from them at the same time. And I would agree with Tom. I typically spent two to four hours per week because <clears throat> a lot of my lessons were having to be dramatically changed, but that was more so due to COVID implications. And like I said earlier, the lack of having um, a restaurant or a cafeteria open. So I dramatically had to change my lesson plans. And I don't think that was specifically to Lumens, but um, my particular situation. So two to four hours. Thank you. Well, we are a little bit past time and that's a, you know, a reminder, my, the little ding on my computer that we're, we need to wrap up. Um, so, uh, John, would you put the final, there's a how to learn more slide, if you could put that up and then we'll uh, close out. Um, so I want to let all the attendees know, we will be sending out a follow-up message that has a recording to this webinar and uh, just links to a couple of other helpful resources if you're interested in learning more, if you're interested in pricing or more details about the different programs that we offer. So look out for that message. Um, I want to say thank you to our wonderful panel and John, of course, for being here. Do you guys have any final thoughts before we wrap up? I highly recommend taking the Lumens program. I learned a lot and I made some wonderful connections and sidebar to everything is I had some Excel spreadsheets that I was struggling with and Tom, who was one of my particular fellows, he was able to help me with something that wasn't even directly related to what we were learning. So you develop some wonderful relationships. I'm picking up a couple of Adrian Carr, who was another fellow, a few of his CDs because he was a wonderful pianist. So some really great um, networking happening too and some hopeful uh, friendships down the road. I would agree with that. I agree. The networking opportunity within and without Lumen was definitely a bonus, but you know anyone who really wants to take a good look at how they instruct their pedagogy and learn different ways to do that, I highly, highly recommend doing a, a Lumen Circle. I, again, I loved it. I liked it so much, I, I asked if I could help facilitate. So it, it's, it's one of those things that just gets into your, your mentality and you just want more. I agree, Tom. I didn't ask to be a facilitator, but I did ask to go through Lumen Circle this fall. So we'll see how that turns out. Super. Um, I think that's a, it's a perfect note to end on. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. And, and thank you to our attendees for taking some time to be with us today. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks.